Well, I think that when multiculturalism policies were first adopted in Europe in the 1970s or so, they were accompanied by a mood of optimism. And uh, they had a certain kind of celebratory quality to them that the hope was that um, if societies made an effort to recognize and uh, accommodate diversity, that this would lead to, to greater harmony and to uh, a more successful society. And a lot of that optimism has really disappeared uh, over the last 10 or 15 years in Europe. And there's a much greater sense of insecurity around issues of immigration and integration. Uh, at the very hard edge, there's, there's kind of radical anti-immigrant uh, populist parties. But even in the middle of the political spectrum, there's much more anxiety and pessimism. Um, and so the result is that people are uh, that, that celebratory uh, and optimistic mood has disappeared. And it's, it's uh, one form that's taken is this very rhetorical attack on multiculturalism, that people blame multiculturalism for having been naive about the challenges of diversity, for, for not having recognized um, the, the real problems that can arise in integrating immigrants. And so we've had a, a rhetorical backlash against multiculturalism as, as being naive, but it hasn't actually led to the retraction of multiculturalism policies in most European countries. Instead, this new f feeling of fear has manifested itself in uh, a, a different set of public policies around what's called civic integration. And that uh, European countries have are managing their fear around issues of immigration, not actually by cutting back on multiculturalism policies, but by adding these uh, often quite coercive and paternalistic policies to promote integration. I think it does. Uh, so there's a number of these new discourse. It's part of the rhetorical retreat from multiculturalism. People have been looking for another term to discuss issues of diversity, and so well, people talk about diversity policies rather than multiculturalism policies, or about interculturalism, uh, or about uh, integration policies, social cohesion. A number of different terms have been used. Um, at one level, um, the change in terminology doesn't matter that much because it hasn't necessarily changed the underlying policies at, at a kind of grassroots level. But at another level, I think the change in discourse does matter because, as I said before, th this shift in discourse is a reflection of a real shift in mood uh, from optimism to anxiety and, and feelings of insecurity and fear. And I immigrant groups are, are very aware that they're now viewed with much greater suspicion and distrust. And, uh, and that makes them more ambivalent about their, their role in society and much more uncertain about about how they're perceived. And, and so even though some of these original multiculturalism policies are still in place, the fact that they're being surrounded by this more uh, pessimistic anxiety, I think, is actually making those policies less successful. They, they, they were intended to encourage and welcome immigrants. But although the policies are still there, because they're surrounded by this, this discourse of anxiety and fear, they're not being as welcoming as they were intended to be. I think that in some countries it's probably too late to try to save the term multiculturalism. It, it, the first retreat from multiculturalism came primarily from right-wing parties who, who one could argue were never very sympathetic to multiculturalism to begin with. But over the last 10 years, even the center and center-left parties in much of Europe, uh, social democratic parties for example, have retreated from the discourse of multiculturalism. And um, the, the Labour government in Britain is, is an example. It, it had championed uh, multiculturalism, but then under, under Blair it um, shifted away. And, and there were quite explicit instructions to, to, go to government ministers not to use the word multiculturalism. And in that context, where both the centre-left and the right have rejected the term, it's, it's, it's become it's become a kind of taboo word. It, it, it's, it's almost, it's, it's just a term of abuse, almost, in political rhetoric in, 
in some European countries. And I, I think that's unfortunate, but it's now hard to reverse. Um, <clears throat> you, you're, if, you, if you continue to identify yourself as a defender of multiculturalism, you're almost immediately marginalized in the public debate. And so if you care about diversity, it's better to find some other way to articulate your claims. But I don't think we're in that situation in Canada. I think that um, actually, um, in terms of, of their official platforms, all, all the major national political parties remain in favor of multiculturalism. And public opinion polls show that it still has fairly high levels of popular support. And so in my view, in, in Canada, and I think the same would be true in, in Australia, for example, that, that um, multiculturalism remains a word with with positive connotations and that we can still use it for, for good work. Well, I, I, it's certainly not possible to just transplant the Canadian model to Europe. Uh, we, have, we have a very different history of immigration, but also a very different uh, immigrant selection process. We, we, uh, select our immigrants uh, based on the point system, which uh, uh, means that we select, by and large, very skilled immigrants, um, more so really than almost any country in the world. We, we pick the, the cream of the crop in terms of immigrants. Uh, and so it's not surprising that we've had more success in the integration of immigrants because they come with higher levels of, of skill and education. And uh, Whereas many of the immigrants in Europe are um, uh, some of them are uh, were originally guest workers who were uh, relatively unskilled. They also have large numbers of um, essentially refugee asylum seekers from from North Africa or from Eastern Europe in the Middle East, um, and so they face challenges in integrating a very different group of immigrants than 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 we have. Um, but one lesson that I think that Canada does have is that it shows that you can combine a commitment to multiculturalism with a strong commitment to, um, to citizenship and to, to national belonging. I mean, th this is something that I think Canada has actually been quite good at, that we, we do quite strongly promote multiculturalism and and the recognition of diversity and the accommodation of diversity. But at the same time, uh, we've, we very much encourage immigrants to identify with the country, to, to feel that they're Canadian, and, and they do come to have a very strong sense of belonging to Canada, very high levels of pride, for example. Uh, immigrants and their children show very high levels of uh, pride in Canada. But also, we, we've connected multiculturalism with citizenship. With, with Multiculturalism isn't just about preserving uh, particular cultural practices in the private sphere, our conception of multiculturalism is, is one that encourages people to contribute to the society as a whole uh, and to participate in society as a whole. And so that um, one way, so multiculturalism is a way of being Canadian and it's a way of exercising one's Canadian citizenship. And, and I think that package of, of multicultural citizenship is actually a very powerful and attractive one.